Introduction The Hittite Empire, a remarkable civilization that thrived in ancient Anatolia, stands as a testament to the endurance of human history. Although overshadowed by more renowned contemporaries like the Egyptians and Mesopotamians, the Hittites left behind a legacy of remarkable achievements and a unique cultural heritage. In this article, we will embark on a journey through time to explore the enigmatic ancient Hittite Empire. The Hittites were a group of people from Anatolia who played a significant role in establishing a kingdom in Kassara, followed by the Kanesh or Nesha kingdom, and eventually an empire centered on Hattusa in north-central Anatolia. Their empire reached its peak during the mid-14th century BC under the reign of King Suppiluliuma I, extending across most of Anatolia and parts of the northern Levant and upper Mesopotamia. During the 15th and 13th centuries BC, the empire of Hattusa, commonly known as the Hittite Empire, engaged in conflicts with the new kingdom of Egypt, the Middle Assyrian Empire, and the Empire of Mitanni, all vying for control of the Near East. Eventually, the Middle Assyrian Empire emerged as the dominant power and took over a large portion of the Hittite Empire, while the remaining parts were sacked by the Phrygian newcomers in the region. Starting from the late 12th century BC, during the collapse of the Late Bronze Age, the Hittites fractured into various independent Syro-Hittite states. Some of these states managed to survive until the 8th century BC before eventually falling under the rule of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The Hittite language, part of the Indo-European language family, was spoken by the Hittites in Anatolia. It is the oldest historically documented Indo-European language. The Hittites referred to their language as Nesali, meaning, the language of Nessa. The Hittites named their kingdom Hattusa after the Hattians, a previous people who inhabited and ruled central Anatolia. The Hattians spoke a different language called Hattic. The term Hittites was coined by 19th century archaeologists who associated the people of Hattusa with the biblical Hittites. The Hittites likely identified themselves as Neshites or Neshans after their city Nesha. However, their king, Labarna, changed his name to Hattusili I and established his capital at Hattusa around 1650 BC. Most of what we know about the Hittite civilization comes from cuneiform texts discovered in the region of their kingdom. Additionally, we have learned about their history through diplomatic and commercial letters found in different archives across Assyria, Babylonia, Egypt, and the Middle East. Deciphering these texts was a significant milestone in the study of Indo-European languages and cultures. In the past, scholars believed that the Hittites of Anatolia were responsible for the development of iron smelting during the Late Bronze Age. They attributed their success to having a monopoly on ironworking. However, this idea has been questioned by scholars and there is no longer a consensus on this matter. The transition from the Late Bronze Age to the Iron Age led to the gradual spread of ironworking technology in the region. While some iron objects have been found in Bronze Age Anatolia, the number is similar to those discovered in Egypt and other contemporaneous locations. And only a small portion of these objects are weapons. X-ray fluorescence spectrometry suggests that most or all irons from the Bronze Age actually originated from meteorites. In addition, the Hittite military effectively utilized chariots. During ancient times, there were small kingdoms in the present-day Syria and other parts of Levant that were ruled by ethnic Hittite dynasties. These dynasties did not have a unified continuity and as a result, their descendants scattered and eventually assimilated into the modern populations of Levant, Turkey, and Mesopotamia. Interest in the Hittites grew during the 1920s when the Republic of Turkey was established in 1923. Turkish archaeologists like Halet Campbell and Tosin Ozguk became interested in the Hittites during this time. The emergence of the field of Hittitology also had an impact on the naming of Turkish institutions, such as the government-owned Edibank, referred to as the Hittite Bank, and the establishment of the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara. This museum, located 200 kilometers west of the Hittite capital of Hattusa, houses the most extensive collection of Hittite art and artifacts in the world. Archaeological Discovery Biblical Background Prior to the archaeological findings that uncovered the existence of the Hittite civilization, the Hebrew Bible was the sole source of information about them. 
In the early 19th century, Francis William Newman held the opinion that no Hittite king could match the power of the king of Judah. According to Archibald Sace, the discoveries made in the second half of the 19th century revealed the vastness of the Hittite kingdom and showed that it should not be compared to Judah but rather to the divided kingdom of Egypt. Sace believed that the Hittite civilization was much more powerful than Judah. Scholars, including Sace, also observed that the Hebrew texts never portrayed Judah and the Hittites as enemies. In fact, in the Book of Kings, the Hittites supplied the Israelites with resources like cedar, chariots, and horses, and in the Book of Genesis, they were depicted as friends and allies of Abraham. Uriah the Hittite even served as a captain in King David's army and was one of his esteemed warriors according to 1 Chronicles 11. Initial Discoveries In 1834, Charles Texier, a French scholar, came across the initial Hittite ruins, although he did not recognize them as such. The earliest proof of the Hittites' existence was discovered in tablets unearthed at the trading post of Kanesh, which is now known as Kultip. These tablets documented the business transactions between Assyrian merchants and a region known as Land of Hatti. Interestingly, some of the names mentioned in these tablets were neither Hattic nor Assyrian but were clearly Indo-European. The engraving on a monument at Bogazkale, which was discovered by William Wright in 1884 and attributed to the people of Hattusis, was found to bear a resemblance to unique hieroglyphic scripts from Aleppo and Hama in northern Syria. In 1887, during excavations in Amarna, Egypt, the diplomatic correspondence of Pharaoh Amenhotep III and his son, Akhenaten, contained two letters from a kingdom known as Kata which appeared to be situated in the same general region as the Mesopotamian references to the land of Hutti. These letters were written in standard Akkadian cuneiform but in an unknown language that scholars could transcribe the sounds of, but not understand the meaning. Shortly after, Say suggested that Hatti or Kadi in Anatolia was the same as the kingdom of Kata mentioned in the Egyptian texts and also associated with the Hittites mentioned in the Bible. This idea gained acceptance throughout the early 20th century, and the name Hittite became linked to the civilization discovered in Bagas Khoi. While conducting occasional archaeology digs at Bagas Khoi, Hattusa, starting in 1906, archaeologist Hugo Winkler made an intriguing discovery. He stumbled upon a royal archive containing 10,000 tablets, all written in cuneiform Akkadian and a mysterious language similar to the Egyptian letters from Kata. This finding ultimately confirmed that the two names were indeed related. Furthermore, Winkler's research successfully demonstrated that the ruins at Bagas Khoi were the remnants of a once mighty empire's capital, which had once held control over northern Syria. The German Archaeological Institute has been conducting excavations at Hattusa since 1907, with breaks during the World Wars. From 1948 until his death in 2005, Professor Tassin Osguk successfully excavated Kultip. Additionally, smaller excavations have occurred in the nearby area of Hattusa, such as at the Rock Sanctuary of Yazilikaya, where there are many rock reliefs depicting Hittite rulers and gods. Writings Hittite cuneiform, a variation of the cuneiform writing system, was employed by the Hittites. Expeditionary teams that explored Hattusa unearthed complete collections of cuneiform tablets within the royal archives. These tablets were written in either Akkadian, the language used for diplomatic purposes during that era, or in the different dialects of the Hittite confederation. Museums The Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara, Turkey houses the richest collection of Hittite and Anatolian artifacts. Geography The Hittite kingdom was centered around Hattusa and Nessa, Kultip, which were known as the Land Hatti. When Hattusa became the capital, the area that was enclosed by the bend of the Kazilarmak River, called Hittite Marisantia or Greek Halis, was considered the heart of the empire. Some Hittite laws even distinguish sh between this side of the river and that side of the river. For instance, the reward for capturing an escaped slave who had fled beyond the river is higher than for a slave caught on the near side. The area to the west and south of the main region was known as Luia in the earliest Hittite texts, but later on, the kingdoms of Arzawa and Kizuwatna emerged and replaced this name. 
However, the Hittites still referred to the language spoken in these areas as Luwian. Before the rise of Kizuatna, the central part of this territory in Cilicia was called Adania by the Hittites. After rebelling against the Hittites during the reign of Amuna, it was renamed Kizuatna and expanded to the north, including the lower Antitorus Mountains. To the north, there lived a group of people called the Kaskians. The Hurrian Empire of Mitanni was situated southeast of the Hittites. During Mersalitus' rule, the Hittite Empire reached its highest point, extending from Arzawa in the west to Mitanni in the east. It also encompassed numerous Kaskian territories in the north, including Hyasaazi in the far northeast. Furthermore, it expanded southward into Canaan, near the southern border of Lebanon. History Origins between 4400 and 4100 BC, the early Hittites migrated to Anatolia, carving out their place as the Anatolian language family diverged from the Proto-Indo-European language. Recent genetic and archaeological studies suggest that the ancestors of Anatolian speakers arrived in this area any time between 500 and 300 BC. The Proto-Hittite language emerged around 2100 BC, and the Hittite language was commonly spoken in central Anatolia from the 20th to the 12th centuries BC. Around the year 1750 BC, the Hittites are initially linked to the kingdom of Kassara. During the Bronze Age, the Hittites in Anatolia lived alongside the Hattians and Hurrians, either through conquest or gradual blending. In terms of archaeology, the Hittites' connections to the Ezero culture in the Balkans and the Makop culture in the Caucasus were previously understood as part of a migration pattern. In 2007, David W. Anthony's research indicated that ancient Indo-European speakers, who lived as steppe herders, migrated to the lower Danube Valley around 4200-400 BC. This migration potentially contributed to or capitalized on the fall of Old Europe. Anthony believed that their languages likely consisted of primitive Proto-Indo-European dialects, some of which were later found in Anatolia. He also suggested that their descendants eventually migrated to Anatolia, potentially as early as 300 BC, although the exact timing is uncertain. J. P. Mallory believed that Anatolian people most likely migrated to the Near East from the north, either through the Balkans or the Caucasus, around 3rd millennium BC. Parpola suggests that the arrival of Indo-European speakers from Europe to Anatolia, and the emergence of the Hittite language, can be linked to the later migrations of Proto-Indo-European speakers from the Yamnaya culture to the Danube Valley around 2800 BC. This aligns with the usual assumption that the Anatolian Indo-European language was introduced to Anatolia during the 3rd millennium BC. Evidence of the Hittite language having crossed the Caucasus can be seen in the fact that many agricultural-related words have been borrowed from cultures on their eastern borders, as Petra Godijbur has demonstrated. The main indigenous people in central Anatolia were the Hurrians and Hattians who spoke languages that were not Indo-European. Some argue that Hattic might have been a northwest Caucasian language, but its connection is still uncertain. On the other hand, the Hurrian language was unique and did not have many close relatives. During the Old Assyrian Empire, 2025-1750 BC, there were also Assyrian colonies in the region. The Hittites, who spoke Assyrian, adopted the Cuneiform script from the Upper Mesopotamian Assyrians. After the collapse of the Old Assyrian Empire in the mid-18th century BC, it took some time for the Hittites to establish themselves, which can be seen in the texts from that period. Initially, there were separate Hittite groups centered around different cities. However, powerful rulers based in Hattusa, modern Bogazkale, eventually managed to unite these groups and conquer a large part of central Anatolia, establishing the Hittite kingdom. Early period During the Middle Bronze Age, the Hittite state emerged in north-central Anatolia along the Kazilarmak River. It was formed by combining various small political entities. The early history of the Hittite kingdom is documented in four tablets, known as the cushion-shaped tablets, classified as Kabo 3.22, Kabo 17.21+, Kabo 22.1, and Kabo 22.2. These tablets were not created in Achua, the Hittite capital, but were likely produced in Kassara, Nessa, or another location in Anatolia. 
They were possibly written in the 18th century BC in the Old Hittite language, with three of them using the Old Script OS. However, most of the surviving tablets are Akkadian copies from the 14th and 13th centuries BC. The tablets reveal a power struggle between two branches of the royal family during the Middle Kingdom. One branch was initially based in Zalpua and later in Hattusa, while the other branch was based in Kassara, which has not yet been found, and the former Assyrian colony of Kanesh. These branches can be distinguished by their names. As the northerners retained Hattian names, a language isolate, while the southerners adopted Indo-European Hittite and Luwian names. In 1833 BC, Zalpua launched an attack on Kanesh while Anna was in power. This occurred during the period when the merchant colony of the old Assyrian Empire was thriving at the site, before Pithana's conquest. The local kings who ruled in Kanesh during this Karim period were Ermali, prior to 1790 BC, Panu, for a brief period in 1790 BC, Inar, approximately 1790 to 1775 BC, and Warsima, around 1775 to 1750 BC. A group of tablets called the Anita text tells the story of how Pithana, the king of Kassara, conquered the neighboring city of Nessa, Kanesh, around 1750 BC. However, the main focus of these tablets is on Pithana's son, Anita who continued his father's conquests and captured several northern cities, including Hattusa, which he cursed, and Zalpua. This was likely used as propaganda by the southern branch of the royal family against the northern branch, who had chosen Hattusa as their capital. Another set of tablets, called the Tale of Zalpua, supports Zalpua and clears Atulai I of the accusation of sacking Kanesh. Zuzu took over after Anita, reigning from 1720 to 1710 BC. However, sometime between 1710 and 1705 BC, Kanesh was destroyed, causing the well-established Assyrian merchant trading system to collapse. Despite this, a noble family from Kassara managed to survive and challenge the zalpuan hattusan family's authority. It remains uncertain if they were directly related to Anita. At the same time, the rulers of Zalpa continued to exist. Hazia I, who was a descendant of a previous Hazia from Zalpa, became the leader of Hatti. However, his son-in-law Labarna I, who came from the southern region of Herma, took control of the throne by force. Nevertheless, Labarna I ensured that Hazia's grandson, Atuali, was adopted and recognized as his own son and future successor. It is thought that the land of Herma is located in the mountainous area to the south of Kassara, Old Kingdom. Either Labarna I or Hadassili I, who may have also been known as Labarna, are thought to be the founders of the Hittite kingdom. They conquered the areas both north and south of Hattusa. Hadassili I led campaigns that went as far as the Amorite kingdom of Yamkad in Syria, where he launched an unsuccessful attack on its capital, Aleppo. However, Hattusili I eventually managed to capture Hattusa and is recognized for establishing the Hittite Empire. Hattusili ruled as king, and he had the support of his sons, brothers, extended family, and soldiers. Whenever he led military expeditions, he successfully took control of enemy territories. He systematically destroyed each land, weakened their power, and expanded his empire to the coastal borders. However, after returning from these campaigns, each of his sons went on to govern different countries where the great cities thrived. Sadly, as time went on, the prince's servants became corrupt. They greedily consumed their master's belongings, constantly plotted against them, and even used violence. This excerpt is from an ancient document called the Edict of Telepinu, written around the 16th century BC. Its purpose is to demonstrate the Hittite solidarity, advancement, and achievements during the rule of Telepinu. It also brings attention to the wrongdoing of the princes, believed to be his sons. It remains unclear how this misconduct was addressed due to limited information. Prior to his passing, Hattusili I designated his grandson, Mersali I, or Mershalish I, as his heir. Labarna I or Hattusili I, possibly known as Labarna, are thought to have established the Hittite kingdom by conquering areas both north and south of Hattusa. 
Hattasili I led military campaigns that reached as far as Yamkad, an Amorite kingdom in Syria. While he attempted to capture Aleppo, the capital of Yamkad, he was unsuccessful. Nonetheless, Hattasili I eventually managed to capture Hattusa and is credited with founding the Hittite Empire. Hattasili ruled as king, and his sons, brothers, extended family, and soldiers were all in agreement. Whenever he embarked on military expeditions, he firmly seized control of the enemy territories. He systematically demolished each region, weakening their power, and extended his empire to the coastal borders. However, upon his return from his campaigns, each of his sons traveled to various countries, and under their leadership, the magnificent cities thrived. Unfortunately, as time went by, the servants of the princes became corrupted. They greedily consumed their master's properties, engaged in constant plots against them, and even resorted to acts of violence. This excerpt is from the Edict of Telepinu, a document written in the 16th century BC. It seeks to demonstrate the unity, advancement, and achievements of the Hittites under the rule of Telepinu. Additionally, it draws attention to the wrongdoings of the princes, presumed to be his sons. However, the exact measures taken to address this corruption remain uncertain due to limited information. Before his passing, Hattasili I designated his grandson, Mersali I, also known as Mershalish I, as his heir. Middle Kingdom During the time of Tidhalia I, the Hittite kingdom emerged from a period of obscurity and entered the Hittite Empire period. This period saw many changes, including a strengthening of the monarchy. The Hittites settled in the older lands of South Anatolia rather than the Aegean region. As they settled, they signed treaties with neighboring peoples. In this empire period, the kingship became hereditary and the king was seen as almost divine, referred to as my son by the Hittite citizens. The kings also took on the role of high priest, conducting annual tours of the holy cities and overseeing religious festivals and sanctuaries. King Tudhalia I, ruling around 1400 BC, formed another alliance with Kizawatna and successfully defeated the Hurrian states of Aleppo and Mitanni. Additionally, he expanded his kingdom to the west, encroaching on the territory of Arzawa, a state of the Luwian people. After an unstable period following Tudhalia I, the Hittites faced threats from various enemies who were able to advance and destroy Hattusa. However, under the rule of Supalulyama I, Around 1350 BC, the kingdom regained its former glory by conquering Aleppo once again. The Assyrians brought Mitanni under their control through marriage, and Supalulima I successfully defeated Karchemish, an Amorite city state. With his sons governing the newly acquired lands and the Kassites still in control of Babylonia, Supalulima became a major power player alongside Assyria and Egypt. Egypt even sought an alliance through his son's marriage to Tutankhamun's widow, however, this alliance never materialized due to the son's murder. Meanwhile, the Middle Assyrian Empire, with the rise of ashur I in 1365 BC, began to regain strength. ashur I defeated the Mitanni king, despite Supalulima I's attempts to protect his throne with military support. Assyria claimed the lands of the Mitanni and Hurrians, which allowed them to encroach on Hittite territory in eastern Asia Minor. Additionally, Adad-Nirari I annexed Karchemish and northeast Syria from the Hittites' control. During the reign of Supalulima I, the Hittite Empire was devastated by a widespread outbreak of tularemia, which lasted for several decades and resulted in the deaths of both Supalulima I and his successor, Arnawanda II. Following the rule of Supalulima I and the short reign of his oldest son, Arnawanda II, Mersali II, another of Supalulima I's sons, became the new king around 1330 BC. With a strong position in the east, Mersali was able to focus his attention on the west and launched an attack on Arzawa. Taking advantage of the weakened state of the Hittites due to the Tularemia epidemic, the Arzawans retaliated, but the Hittites defended themselves by sending infected rams to the Arzawans, marking the first recorded instance of biological warfare. Mersali also conducted a military campaign against a city called Milawanda, also known as Miletus, which was controlled by Ahiwa. Recent research, 
based on new readings and interpretations of Hittite texts, as well as material evidence of Mycenaean interactions with the Anatolian mainland, suggests that Ahiua referred to Mycenaean Greece, or at least a part of it. Battle of Kadesh The Hittite civilization relied heavily on controlling trade routes and sources of metal for its prosperity. The defense of northern Syria, which connected the Cilician Gates and Mesopotamia, was crucial because of its role in these vital routes. However, their control of this area was challenged by the expansion of the Egyptian Empire led by Pharaoh Ramesses II. The outcome of the Battle of Kadesh, which was fought between the Hittites and the Egyptians, remains uncertain. It appears that the arrival of Egyptian reinforcements prevented the Hittites from achieving a complete victory. The Egyptians managed to force the Hittites to seek shelter in the fortress of Kadesh, but their own losses prevented them from sustaining a siege. This battle occurred in the fifth year of Ramesses, around 1274 BC according to the commonly accepted chronology, downfall and demise of the kingdom. After this time, the power of both the Hittites and Egyptians started to decline once again because of the strength of the Assyrians. The Assyrian king Shalmaneser I took advantage of this situation by conquering Huria and Mitanni, taking over their lands, and expanding up to the head of the Euphrates River, while Muwatali was focused on dealing with the Egyptians. Despite the Hittites' futile attempts to preserve the Mitanni kingdom through military support, Assyria now posed a just as significant threat to Hittite trade routes as Egypt had in the past. Muwatali's son, Urhiteshub, became king and ruled for seven years as Mersali III before being overthrown by his uncle, Hattasili III, after a short civil war. In response to the increasing annexation of Hittite territory by the Assyrians, Hattasili III established a peace and alliance with Ramesses II, who was also wary of Assyria, by offering his daughter in marriage to the pharaoh. This resulted in the Treaty of Kadesh, one of the oldest surviving treaties in history, which defined their mutual boundaries in southern Canaan and was signed in the 21st year of Ramesses' reign, around 1258 BC. The terms of the treaty included the marriage of one of the Hittite princesses to Ramesses. Hattasili's son, Tudhalia IV, was the final strong Hittite ruler who was somewhat successful in keeping the Assyrians out of the Hittite heartland, although he did lose a significant amount of territory to them. He suffered a major defeat from Tukulti-Ninurta I of Assyria in the Battle of Nerea, and even had the island of Cyprus temporarily under Hittite control before it was also taken by Assyria. The last king, Suppiluliuma II, achieved some victories, including a naval battle against Alashia off the coast of Cyprus. However, the Assyrians, led by Ashurashishi I, had already annexed a substantial portion of Hittite territory in Asia Minor and Syria. The Sea Peoples had also begun their campaign along the Mediterranean coastline, seizing Cilicia and Cyprus from the Hittites and disrupting their trade routes. This left the Hittite homeland vulnerable to attacks from various directions, resulting in the destruction of Hattusa in around 1180 BC by the Kaskians, Phrygians, and Bryges. As a result, the Hittite kingdom disappeared from historical records, with much of its territory being taken over by Assyria. Internal issues, along with environmental factors such as drought, also contributed to the downfall of the Hittite kingdom during the Bronze Age collapse. Post-Hittite period By 1160 BC, the political situation in Asia Minor looked vastly different from that of only 25 years earlier. In that year, the Assyrian king tiglath pileser I was defeating the Mushki, Phrygians, who had been attempting to press into Assyrian colonies in southern Anatolia from the Anatolian highlands, and the Koska people, the Hittites' old enemies from the northern hill country between Hutti and the Black Sea, seemed to have joined them soon after. The Phrygians had apparently overrun Cappadocia from the west, with recently discovered epigraphic evidence confirming their origins as the Balkan Bryges, tribe, forced out by the Macedonians. Although the Hittite kingdom disappeared from Anatolia at this point, there emerged a number of so-called Syro-Hittite states in Anatolia and northern Syria. They were the successors of the Hittite kingdom. The most notable Syro-Hittite kingdoms were those at Carchemish and Melod. With the ruling family in Karchemish believed to have been in cadet branch of the then-defunct central ruling Hittite line. 
These Syro-Hittite states gradually fell under the control of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, 911-608 BC. Karchami Shan Melid were made vassals of Assyria under Shalmaneser III, 858-823 BC, and fully incorporated into Assyria during the reign of Sargon II, 722-705 BC. A large and powerful state known as Table occupied much of southern Anatolia. Known as Greek Tiberinoi, Ancient Greek, Tau Iota Beta Alpha Rho Eta Nu Omicron, Latin Tiberini, Thobles in Josephus, their language may have been Luwian, testified to by monuments written using Anatolian hieroglyphs. This state too was conquered and incorporated into the vast Neo-Assyrian Empire. Ultimately, both Luwian hieroglyphs and cuneiform were rendered obsolete by an innovation, the alphabet, which seems to have entered Anatolia simultaneously from the Aegean, with the Bryges, who changed their name to Phrygians, and from the Phoenicians and neighboring peoples in Syria. Government The earliest known constitutional monarchy was developed by the Hittites. The head of the Hittite state was the king, followed by the heir apparent. The king was the supreme ruler of the land, in charge of being a military commander, judicial authority, as well as a high priest, however, some officials exercised independent authority over various branches of the government. One of the most important of these posts in the Hittite society was that of the Gal Mesidi, chief of the royal bodyguards. It was superseded by the rank of the Gal Gestin, chief of the wine stewards, who, like the Gal Mesidi, was generally a member of the royal family. The kingdom's bureaucracy was headed by the Gal Dubsar, chief of the scribes, whose authority did not extend over the Lugal Dubsar, the king's personal scribe. Egyptian monarchs engaged in diplomacy with two chief Hittite seats, located at Kadesh, a city located on the Orontes River, and Karchemish, located on the Euphrates River in southern Anatolia. Religion of the Early Hittites In the central Anatolian settlement of Ankawa, home of the pre-Hittite goddess Kaktaha and the worship of other Hattic deities illustrates the ethnic differences in the areas the Hittites tried to control. Kaktaha was originally given the name Hanakin. The usage of the term Kaktaha over Hanakin, according to Ronald Gorney, head of the Alazar regional project in Turkey, was a device to downgrade the pre-Hittite identity of this female deity, and to bring her more in touch with the Hittite tradition. Their reconfiguration of gods throughout their early history such as with Kattaha was a way of legitimizing their authority and to avoid conflicting ideologies in newly included regions and settlements. By transforming local deities to fit their own customs, the Hittites hoped that the traditional beliefs of these communities would understand and accept the changes to become better suited for the Hittite political and economic goals. The Pancas King Telepinu, reign c. 1525 c. 1500 BC, is considered to be the last king of the old kingdom of the Hittites. He seized power during a dynastic power struggle. During his reign, he wanted to take care of lawlessness and regulate royal succession. He then issued the Edict of Telepinus. In this edict, he designated the Pancus, which was a general assembly, as the high court for constitutional crimes. Crimes such as murder were observed and judged by the Pancus. Kings themselves were also subject to jurisdiction under the Pancus. The Pancus also served as an advisory council for the king. The rules and regulations set out by the edict, and the establishment of the Pancus proved to be very successful and lasted all the way through to end of the new kingdom. The Pancus established a legal code where violence was not a punishment for a crime. Crimes such as a murder and theft, which at the time were punishable by death, in other Southwest Asian kingdoms, were not capital crimes under the Hittite law code. Most criminal penalties involved restitution. For example, in cases of thievery, the punishment of that crime would to be to repay what was stolen in equal value. Language The Hittite language is recorded fragmentarily from about the 19th century BC, in the Kultip texts, see Ishera. It remained in use until about 1100 BC. Hittite is the best attested member of the Anatolian branch of the Indo-European language family, 
and the Indo-European language for which the earliest surviving written attestation exists, with isolated Hittite loanwords and numerous personal names appearing in an old Assyrian context from as early as the 20th century BC. The language of the Hattusa tablets was eventually deciphered by a Czech linguist, Bedra Trozny, 1879-1952, on November 24, 1915, announced his results in a lecture at the Near Eastern Society of Berlin. His book about the discovery was printed in Leipzig in 1917, under the title The Language of the Hittites, its structure and its membership in the Indo-European linguistic family. The preface of the book begins with the present work undertakes to establish the nature and structure of the hitherto mysterious language of the Hittites, and to decipher this language it will be shown that Hittite is in the main an Indo-European language. The decipherment famously led to the confirmation of the laryngeal theory in Indo-European linguistics, which had been predicted several decades before. Due to its marked differences in its structure and phonology, some early philologists, most notably Warren Cowgill, had even argued that it should be classified as a sister language to Indo-European languages, Indo-Hittite, rather than a daughter language. By the end of the Hittite Empire, the Hittite language had become a written language of administration and diplomatic correspondence. The population of most of the Hittite Empire by this time spoke Luwian, another Indo-European language of the Anatolian family that had originated to the west of the Hittite region. According to Craig Melchert, the current tendency is to suppose that Proto-Indo-European evolved, and that the prehistoric speakers of Anatolian became isolated from the rest of the PIE speech community, so as not to share in some common innovations. Hittite, as well as its Anatolian cousins, split off from Proto-Indo-European at an early stage, thereby preserving archaisms that were later lost in the other Indo-European languages. In Hittite there are many loan words, particularly religious vocabulary, from the non-Indo-European Hurrian and Haptic languages. The latter was the language of the Hattians, the local inhabitants of the land of Hutti before being absorbed or displaced by the Hittites. Sacred and magical texts from Hattusa were often written in Haptic, Hurrian, and Luwian, even after Hittite became the norm for other writings. Due to the vast extent of the Hittite empire, the remnants of Hittite art are relatively scarce. These remnants encompass remarkable monumental carvings, various rock reliefs, as well as metalwork, notably the Alaka Hoyuk bronze standards, intricately carved ivory pieces, and ceramics such as the Husian deed vases. Among the most significant constructed sculptures are the Sphinx gates of Alaka Hoyuk and Hattusa, as well as the monument located at the spring of Efladan Pinar. Additionally, a number of large recumbent lions can be found with the largest one possibly being the Lion of Babylon statue in Babylon, if indeed it is of Hittite origin. Almost all of these artifacts exhibit noticeable signs of wear. The collection of rock reliefs includes the Hanyeri relief and the Hemite relief. Furthermore, there's the Nigda steel, a Luwian monument dating back to the end of the 8th century BC, hailing from the post-Hittite period and discovered in the modern-day Turkish city of Nigda. Military Might one of the defining characteristics of the Hittite Empire was its military prowess. The Hittite army was a formidable force, utilizing advanced tactics and weaponry for their time. They were particularly known for their use of chariots, which played a crucial role in their success on the battlefield. The Hittites clashed with various adversaries throughout their history, including the Egyptians, Mitanni, and Assyrians. Their interactions with these neighboring powers led to shifting alliances, treaties, and conflicts that would define their foreign policy, diplomacy and treaty-making. The Hittite Empire was a master of diplomacy and treaty-making. Hittite kings, such as Suppaluyama I and Hattasili III, engaged in complex diplomatic negotiations with their neighbors. One of the most famous examples of Hittite diplomacy is the Treaty of Kadesh, a peace agreement between the Hittites and Egyptians. This treaty, which dates to around 1259 BCE, is one of the earliest known peace treaties in history, religion and mythology. Hittite religious beliefs and mythology exhibited significant influences from their Hattic, Mesopotamian, Canaanite, and Hurrian counterparts. In earlier periods, 
one can still discern traces of Indo-European elements in their religious traditions. Among the deities in the Hittite pantheon, the storm gods held prominent positions. Tarhunt, also known as Tezhub in Hurrian mythology, held titles such as the Conqueror, the King of Kamiya, King of Heaven, and Lord of the Land of Hatti. He occupied the highest rank among the gods, and his emblem was the bull. Depicted as Tezhub, he appeared as a bearded figure straddling two mountains and wielding a club. He was revered as the god of warfare and triumph, particularly in conflicts involving foreign powers. Tezhub was notably famous for his conflict with the serpent Ilyanka. The Hittite gods received reverence through various festivals, including Puroli in the spring, the Nuntariyash's festival in the autumn, and the Ki.Lam festival celebrated at the gatehouse, during which images of the storm god and as many as thirty other idols were paraded through the streets. Law Hittite legal principles, like other records from the empire, were inscribed on cuneiform tablets crafted from baked clay. The Hittite law code, as it is understood, is primarily derived from two clay tablets, each comprising 186 articles. These tablets serve as a compilation of established laws from the early Hittite kingdom. Additionally, throughout central Anatolia, you can find monuments adorned with Hittite cuneiform inscriptions that elucidate the government and legal codes of the empire. These tablets and monuments span from the old Hittite kingdom, 1650 to 1500 BC, to what is referred to as the New Hittite Kingdom, 1500 to 1180 BC. During the transitions between these time periods, various translations emerged, modernizing the language and introducing a series of legal reforms, resulting in more humane penalties for many offenses. These transformations may be attributed to the ascent of new and diverse rulers throughout the empire's history or the adaptation of the language used in the law codes. In either case, the Hittite law codes delineate precise fines and penalties for specific transgressions and exhibit numerous parallels with the legal principles found in the biblical books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. In addition to addressing criminal sanctions, these law codes also offer guidance on matters such as inheritance and matters related to death. The Fall of the Hittite Empire Despite its strength, the Hittite Empire began to decline around the 12th century BCE. The exact reasons for its fall remain a subject of debate among historians. Factors such as invasions by the Sea Peoples, internal conflicts, and natural disasters may have contributed to its downfall. Hattusa was eventually abandoned, and the Hittite Empire faded into obscurity. Legacy and Rediscovery The Hittites, while forgotten for centuries, were not lost to history. Their legacy has been slowly rediscovered and pieced together through the deciphering of Hittite inscriptions and archaeological excavations. Today, researchers continue to unravel the mysteries of this remarkable civilization. In conclusion, the ancient Hittite Empire, with its military might, diplomacy, and contributions to culture and religion, stands as a testament to the rich tapestry of human history. Although it may have faded into the annals of time, the Hittite Empire's legacy endures as an intriguing chapter in the story of ancient Anatolia.